Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, living through the dying of the earth, our guest, Daniel Sherrill, is the author of a powerful new book called Warmth, Coming of Age at the End of Our World. Daniel Sherrill is an organizer born in 1990. He helped lead the campaign to pass landmark climate justice legislation in New York and is the recipient of a Fulbright grant in creative nonfiction. He currently serves as campaign director for the Climate Jobs National Resource Center. Daniel Sherrill, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming on. Uh, I, I hate to say that I enjoyed a book about the human world ending and the frustration of seeing human institutions refuse to save it, but it is a very well done book. Uh, thank you for writing it. Um, I, I, I generally refer to climate collapse. Other people say global warming or global heating, but you just say the problem. Why is that? I think the choice I was making there, I felt for a long time pretty frustrated with climate change discourse in this country. Um, it felt like it'd been pigeonholed into a little environmental box, like that was the purview of environmentalists. And when the word climate change was invoked, um, it had a sort of like technocratic, scientific, um, sort of like it's out there in the ether, it's a current event, but it's not happening to you kind of feel to it. Um, and I felt pretty desperate to break it out of that pigeonhole and to defamiliarize it for people, um, which is why I never refer to it by name, any, any of its many names in the book. But um, I also think that when I, you know, the, the most obvious reading of what I refer to as the problem is uh, the climate crisis or climate collapse or global warming, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I actually think that those set of phenomena that are happening in our atmosphere and to our biosphere are more the symptom than the problem. I think the root problem um, lies more in the sorts of attention we give to what kinds of things and the kinds of blinders we've built into our economy and to our worldview in the 21st century um, that have, in fact, made us blind to what may be the, mo the most important things, um, such as uh, <laughs> our deep interdependence with the non-human world um, and with generations before us and that are still coming. So, um, yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to narrow it and make it the thin view of the problem, which is just parts per million of carbon accumulating in the atmosphere. I wanted to um, wrap my head and my heart around uh, a problem that feel, felt um, both <laughs> more abstract because it has to deal with the kinds of ontological weight uh, we give to the world around us um, and also much broader um, because uh, it implicates human systems and societies and not just uh, this set of sort of blunt scientific principles. In other words, deep problems with our culture and with our institutions uh, that prevent dealing with the specific problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as long as we're getting our terminology straight, uh, what's a Pruitt? A Pruitt, yeah. Another... Uh... Another little um, sort of synecdoche that I use. I So Pruitt um, most immediately refers to Scott Pruitt, who some people might remember as the former EPA director, a, a coal lobbyist um, uh, appointed with the task of regulating the industry that had birthed him. Of course, he did not do that very well. Um, in fact, he did exactly the opposite, which was exactly what he was supposed to do. Um, but... I, I invoke the word Pruitt to typify this whole class of people that um, seem capable of acts of almost unspeakable evil. I mean, the, the way that I refer to think about this in the book is that, um, you know, I start by imagining somebody who would be made very rich and powerful by performing a set of actions that would have one in 1,000 chance 
likelihood of killing millions of people and destabilizing human civilization. And obviously, if you chose that, even with a one in 1,000 chance, you know, that, that would be monstrous. And then you imagine one in 100, and then you imagine one in 10. And then you imagine that these people, and they're not, they're not dumb people. They know the science. ExxonMobil has known the science since the 70s and systematically suppressed it with millions of dollars worth of propaganda. Um, but these are people who presented with evidence that suggests that it is extremely likely or perhaps inevitable that if they pursue the course of action they're pursuing, um, they would put millions of lives at risk, have proceeded um, to double down on the status quo. It's a kind of, you know, it really evokes Hannah Arendt's banality of evil. Um, but it also just confuses me a little bit. Um, and this is, might be a naive interpretation, but I, I don't feel like in my personal life, uh, I've met somebody who I would deem capable of those sorts of acts. I think there is a way in which we've created uh, institutions that mold people to do terrible things. But I also think we've created corporate, corporate and political governance structures that probably self-select for sociopaths, people who are very charming and diligent, but um, mm -hmm. place very little worth in the lives of their fellow humans. So anyway, I, this is the gloss I uh, use for this entire group of people with whom I have, um, to put it mildly, a deeply fraught and rage-based relationship. And, 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 it's, and you note this in the book, that it's something about the level of evil makes it hard for ordinary, decent people to believe in it, to believe it's happened, to believe people could have done something as monstrous as suppress the science for decades on the destruction of the Earth's climate. I mean, it's like the, 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 the coverage of the war on Afghanistan and the, the media outlets just desperately clawing to find some legitimate reason people must have had. It couldn't have been just reckless, you know, slaughtering of, of thousands and thousands of human beings for no earthly reason whatsoever. There must have been some, because yeah. you and I and our friends and our neighbors wouldn't do something that horrific. It can't have happened. Uh, is, is that part of how is the, is the level of evil of the Pruitts uh, part of why ordinary people don't seem to get it? I think there's that, certainly. Um, and I also think there's a principle whereby I think violence in the 21st century looks very different than what we're taught to see as violence. We're taught to see violence as a very specific causal chain, uh, murder, pillage, um, you know, theft, um, even like human rights abuses at scale, like we, we can recognize as violence. But in the 21st century where um, causal chains, because of globalization and because of technological advancement, causal chains are uh, often much lengthier and more abstract, or I shouldn't say more abstract, less tang immediately tangible to us, um, though no less real and consequential. Um, um, it's harder to track violence and it's harder to view it with that same sort of Cain and Abel level of like, you know, bad intent, bad action, bad outcome. Um, that's less evident to people because the, the chain of events is so um, circuitous and diffuse and probabilistic, uh, and yet it's real. You know, it is real, and we must insist upon its reality that these people do not, there, there is no defense to be made of their actions in the abstraction of the problem, none whatsoever, um, because they were armed with all the facts they needed to make the decision, um, and even if they weren't, they had the they had immense power to be able to harvest those facts to, be, to inform uh, what would have been a right uh, course of action. So... But I try not to, you know, I write a lot about the Pruitts because I feel a lot of rage around the climate crisis, especially as a young person. I, I, um, I can feel it as a kind of necrotic force <laughs> inside me, um, but I don't, um, I don't want to let it be the basis for my engagement on the climate crisis. One, because I feel, it just feels horrible inside my own head when my political and, and when my political enemies and these titans of evil are taking up all the airspace. Um, but also I just think strategically rage is um, an incredibly justifiable, but ultimately not very sustainable 
source of the kinds of solidarity and courage we're going to have to demonstrate to get through the next, the coming centuries. Um, so by the end of the book, I try to, you know, steer the focus of my mind away from defeating the Pruitts that I hate um, and towards saving all the people and places and principles that I love. Yeah. When it, uh, we're speaking with Daniel Sherrill, whose book is Warmth, uh, Coming of Age at the End of Our World. When you talk about what you worked on in New York State in terms of passing legislation, uh, you don't really label Governor Cuomo a Pruitt. You don't even say his name. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that effort uh, and what you accomplished in New York State? Sure. Um, yeah, it's funny reading the Cuomo chapters now that he's um, – very satisfyingly to me, going up in political flames. Um, it, that is. Would long... you be more satisfied if it was for some of the, some of his uh, long-standing outrageous uh, yeah. behavior? I... Yeah, I mean, obviously, he's his treatment of w- women is not um, is not an exception to the rule, and it's, it's an extension of the rule, which is that he um, wielded his power with impunity and as an end in itself, which led to some very bad decision-making. And Rebecca Traster, the journalist, has an amazing riff about uh, <laughs> Governor Cuomo as sort of like uh, an actor of power but in, or an actor of decision-making and leadership. But in fact, the projection of leadership uh, is often a good signal that act- real leadership is not happening. Um, but, um, you know, this was an effort... Um, to pass what is still, I believe, the most ambitious climate and equity legislation in the country, to transition the state of New York to 100% renewable energy, to make sure that at least 40% of the investments made to do that go to communities on the front line of sea level rise and particulate pollution, mostly black and brown communities, mostly low low income, and then to, wherever possible, attach fair labor standards to renewable energy projects receiving state funding. That was the bill. We formed a big coalition of environmental justice organizations, sort of mainline green and climate organizations, labor unions, community groups, to make that effort happen. Um, And in classic fashion, I mean, this might be juicy for some of your listeners. I mean, the obvious trajectory was we pushed and pushed and pushed on this for about two years, and uh, Cuomo blocked us and blocked us and blocked us until we made the political calculus unavoidable, at which point he got, went to the front of the parade and he claimed the bill as his own, which like, you know, great. We we're happy if his ego is the thing that brings it across the finish line. Um, fine. But, uh, yeah, one detail I didn't get to mention in the book is that, um, I would sometimes, I think on two occasions, his chief of staff, Melissa DeRosa, who's now, who was the one who was, um, she was tasked with um, <laughs> destroying the character of the young women who came out bravely and, and told the public what happened between her and the governor. Um, and this is, this is a woman who, by the way, constantly, um, <laughs> you know, whenever she was called out for doing something like totally unethical and nefarious, um, like hid behind the veil of like boss bitch feminism to be like, you can't criticize me because I'm a powerful woman. Um, but uh, I remember some nights when we were being putting particularly hard pressure on the governor, she would call me um, and, you know, these people don't wait for you to say hi on the phone. They, you just pick up and they just start screaming down the phone at you, basically trying to berate you into submission or something and really worked, you know, governed through a kind of animal fear sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, um, which even then, when I was on the phone, I mean, I, it's just, you got to laugh. It's like so patently ridiculous um, how these people operate. So anyway, that's an aside, but that was the effort. We eventually did, despite their best intentions or their worst intentions, get the bill passed. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and it requires a transition to renewable energy over what time period? Um, energy sector... And buildings by 2030, transportation by 2050. And and are there requirements along the way or for each year, a, st- a step in that direction? Yeah, I think, I believe there, it's been four years since I ran this campaign. I believe there are f- like five-year inter- incremental goals along the way. Yeah. 
in is it enough if if every state and every country and every continent were to do the same is it is it is that enough yeah i mean we were working backwards from what the science dictates um but i also think this concept of enough is sort of tricky because climate change is not a binary problem um you know it's not like nuclear holocaust where you either press a button or you don't and everybody dies or they don't there's a whole huge spectrum of outcomes um so the ideal legislation would decarbonize the economy uh by yesterday that legislation doesn't exist nor does that technology exist um so it's about how far how how quickly can you push the pedal to the metal um well, in your electric vehicles to get rid of the current economy right oh, to live as people lived pre-industrialization that technology has always existed right yeah and the technology exists even to not quote unquote go backwards the technology exists to power our society with 100 percent renewable energy it's just about bringing that online so anyway in general to have a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees celsius of warming the latest we can have decarbonized the entire world economy is by 2050 is about by mid-century um and so this is sort of like a bill like that which right, right now represents the ceiling of our ambition nationally should really be the floor yeah the uh it, it seems like we have a problem of corrupt broken systems of governance uh, but also a, a, a lack of action by a large enough fraction of people to, to overcome that corruption. Uh, it, it, it's more than the Pruitts. I'm worried about the 99.9% of people who are watching television, you know, who aren't putting in a bit of activism of the sort that you've been organizing. When, if we had just 5% more people seriously engaged, it would make a tremendous difference. How do we account for the the incredible inaction? Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm not a fatalist on this point. I actually think that the climate movement has won incredible victories even in the last five years and what it's brought, the, the level of policy change it's brought into the mainstream of the Democratic Party um, and I think that trend has to continue and I'm hopeful that it will. Um, so I definitely don't think all is lost on this point. And, but as you said, they did that with a, a very small fraction of the general public participating. Um, on the one hand, you know, I think of the research of Erica Chenoweth, who studied, you know, nonviolent revolutions and other nonviolent policy sea changes throughout history. And her, the magic number she points to is um, no, nothing comparable and of course like the sample size here is like pretty heterogeneous but putting that aside uh no comparable non-violent policy sea change or quote-unquote revolution has ever failed once it's mobilized just three percent of the population so i think the reality is you know you look around and you see it you know the, the baseline is is apathy and non-involvement and I probably think that's always going to be true, partially because um, we live in a country whose economy produces desperation as its fuel and so requires people to focus only on the lowermost rung of Maslow's pyramid uh, and the, his hierarchy of needs. Um, but I also think, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I do I do think there's, there's always going to be a majority of the people who aren't really like looking to be inside of the slips, the slipstream of history. Do I think we can get to 3%, especially with the increase in climate impacts we're seeing literally multiple times a week around the country right now? Yes, I think we can, but it's going to be take some inspired organizing from the climate movement. Um, and like, me, like, uh, you know, still need to scale tenfold, but I don't think we need to scale a thousandfold. You're Daniel, Cheryl, your your conversation is a lot more encouraging and optimistic than your book at times. Uh, you <laughs> say you're not a fatalist, yet you were quite upset when someone committed suicide over this climate crisis and it failed to really make a difference because that took the option of, of suicide as a useful tool away. Yeah. Um, 
it sounds a little fatalistic. Um, have you have you become more in, encouraged uh, because of events or because of the response to your book, or am I or am I off uh, the mark here? I think um, I think people the people I've spoken to so far find different things in the book, um, and I think it's not. Um, it's an ambivalent book in that I try to write through and of all the various emotional postures I take to the climate crisis, which are manifold and change day to day. And there are days where I can't get out of bed in the morning because I'm so depressed. And there are days where I think we might just pull this out. And most days exist somewhere, you know, in the middle of that spectrum. Um, and I think it's important to allow for that sort of uh, <laughs> diversity of feeling with regard to this thing. But, you know, um, I would I would say that that book starting in that very dark place um, arrives somewhere that I wouldn't describe as hope because I think people conflate optimism with hope and you know um, assume that you know the assumption would be that I think this is all going to end well and I think I I don't necessarily think that at all I think it could end really horribly um, but I'm not despairing. I'm not despairing um, because, first of all, what the latest IPCC report has made extremely vivid to us, A, is that things are getting much, much worse and we need to act urgently. It's like what we've been screaming from the rooftops for the past decade. But it's also that every tenth of a degree, we manage to bend that thermometer down or not bend it down we are saving or consigning millions of people to life or death. So it really is the moral stakes of this thing remain the same. Like there's no room for despair. There's a huge, there's a huge amount still to save and there's a huge amount of solidarity to be acted upon. So, um, I don't know, in a way that latest IPCC report was motivating, if anything else, because it revealed there are still moral stakes here and they are enormous. They are absolutely enormous. Um, but, you know, I also, um, I think fatalism, much like blind optimism, they both, they both to me have always sort of seemed like a cop out, like a desire to like find an ultimate answer to how this thing is going to go and then put yourself in the box of that answer and not have to examine it any further. Um, and I think the biggest reality of this is it's probably, it's going to be messy and confusing and circuitous and expanding and contracting and everything at once for the rest of our lives. And we're going to have to ride its waves and do our best to, you know, uh, act out of love and solidarity. And it's, that's, uh, it's an immensely difficult task, but also I can't think of a, I don't know. I can't think of a, of a, you know, a more important way to live a human life. <laughs> And, and the optimism or pessimism is a bit of a distraction from the work, right? Yeah. Which which is can actually be quite rewarding, even, you know, rolling a rock up a hill over and over again, knowing damn well it might roll back down. It yeah. can be rewarding and satisfying to do the work. Uh, so one thing we can recommend to people who are despairing uh, is that they get engaged and make a difference, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, if you're listening right now, Three days from now, on August 19th, there are what is known as seal the deal actions. Just Google hashtag seal the deal all over the country, putting pressure on Congress not to back down from the $3.5 trillion reconciliation package that is on a knife's edge in our legislature right now. And it's both A, not adequate, again, the floor of our ambitions, not the ceiling, and B, would be the most important piece of climate legislation ever passed in this country by an order of magnitude. Um, and so it's deeply important that we get that thing across the finish line. Um, so there's a real, uh, I realize I'm mentioning dates here, but on August 19th, um, if that's the date still relevant, there's seal the deal actions. Um, and, um, throughout the summer, there's going to be ongoing pressure on members of Congress to, um, not kowtow to Republican denialism or centrist, uh, deficit hawk bullshit, uh, and instead actually solve spend money to solve problems. <laughs> and and what are the, this is, you know, a complicated bill that isn't even written yet. What are the most important 
pieces to keep in it? The most important pieces, I mean, a lot of it's important, but I think, first of all, massive investments and incentives for renewable energy development at scale. Um, huge investments in climate resilience, especially for frontline communities. Huge investments in the care economy. So how we care for our elderly, how we care for our sick, our, our differently abled, our children, all people who are most vulnerable to climate change, and we need to make them more resilient. And that's also good, hopefully unionized, low carbon work. Um, and then for things, keeping things in like retrofitting every public school in the nation to make it fully carbon zero and solarized, creating millions of union jobs in that process creating a civilian climate course so that young people, much like in the New Deal when we had the CC, the original CCC, can make a career actually in transitioning our economy to renewable energy and uh, remediating the ecosystems we've destroyed. Um, um, all of those are incredibly important uh, pieces and I'm sure they're line items that I'm forgetting, but um, the thing that I always think about is like in the 21st century also, everything is climate work. Right? If people have more savings, they're more resilient to climate disasters. If they have more access to education, they're more resilient to climate disasters. If they have free Medicare for all, they are more resilient to climate disasters. If they're not getting shot by the police, they will have more emotional energy to spend preparing their family for the upheaval that is going to come in the next decades. So um, really anything we're doing to further knit the fabric of society and allow people to live lives of um, decency and stability, that is climate work. Yes, indeed. Uh, we've got just like a minute and a half left. Daniel, Cheryl, there's also a, a summit coming up in November, COP26 uh, climate summit. Any chances you think of that being uh, more significant than the, the previous 25? Honestly, I'm so focused on my work on domestic cl climate politics right now and getting, uh, you know, my day job is trying to mobilize the labor movement into a more aggressive posture on climate policy. Um, I, so I haven't been paying that much attention to COP26. I suspect um, that if any progress is made, it will be because the Biden administration puts up some major new benchmark that makes the EU and the Chinese feel like they have to ante up. I don't know what's in the works there. Um, I'm, am I worried that a lot of this falls on John Kerry's shoulders? Yes, I am worried about that. Um, but I also think, um, you know, for those despairing about climate change right now and the climate crisis, yes, things are getting bad, visibly worse in 2021, even compared to like 2015, but also politically, we have the window at our backs in a way that we, we've never had before. So um, to bow out now would be to step away exactly in the moment when we need to step up and step in. So, um, yeah. So time to get engaged. Uh, start by picking up a copy of Daniel Sherrill's book, which is called Warmth, Coming of Age at the End of Our World. Daniel Sherrill is the campaign director for the Climate Jobs National Resource Center, Daniel, Cheryl, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much, David. It was really great. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.